Good afternoon and welcome to Shop Talk Live. On the panel this afternoon, we're joined by Joe Barrett, Chief Operating Officer of Apple Green, Debbie Robinson, the Chief Executive at Cent Central England Cooperative, and Derek Gaskins, Chief Marketing Officer at Yesway. And your host this afternoon is Dan Munford, Managing Director of Insight Research. Dan, over to you. It's Friday afternoon. Um, welcome to Shop Talk Live. Um, delighted uh, to, uh, to, to, to have Joe, Debbie and Derek uh, on the panel this afternoon. We're talking about the UK, Irish and US market and um, collectively, um, and I know this because I've been around for almost a couple of decades and known, and known you guys for, the, for that length of time, you have around 85 years of collective experience uh, in this industry and um, you are well known as innovators and leaders uh, in, in those markets and globally. So I think we've, we're going to make the most of your experience in the next 45 minutes. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. Welcome, Dan. Looking forward to the chat. Thank Likewise. you. Thank you. Great. And um, as you know, um, so we've got an audience of 140 uh, for, this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, so the largest so far, uh, 20 countries altogether. And um, the largest three groups, uh, I won't go through all the countries, but the largest three groups are from the UK, the US and Ireland, um, which makes sense because we're particularly focusing on those three, market, those three markets, which is where you guys operate. Um, so um, as with the normal format, uh, we've got 45 minutes. We will keep to time um, because uh, I know that's important to, to everybody. We're, we're all, everyone's very busy in retail. And um, we'll take questions as we get towards the first 30, 30, 35 minutes of the program today. So I'll start to feed those through. So please type them as, as we go um, uh, over there in the audience. And, uh, and then I'll promise I'll, I'll try and get through as many of them as possible before we finish at 2.45 UK time. So with that, um, perhaps we can go to the first question, which is the biggie. Uh, in many ways, um, and perhaps I could go to you first, Joe. Um, the timing of coming back, um, how do you see it happening? What's your, what's your perspective on that? Okay, well, firstly, greetings from a wet but sunny Dublin, in uh, Dublin, Ireland, that is. And um, we're all self-isolating still here. Um, there's due to be a big announcement tonight from our Taoiseach about the Irish business, but the expectation is, is that there won't be any change really to the lockdown until the end of the month of May uh, towards towards that. So I think for the Irish side of the business, what we're seeing is that our local petrol filling stations are performing well and the motorway sites are being significantly impacted by the lack of travel and especially the food to go with those. So we don't see the start of any kind of comeback until starting towards the end of May into, into June. We think it'd be very gradual. There was an initially a, a discussion about a V-shaped recovery. We now think it'll be much more like a hockey stick. We're, we're sensing that we'll get back to maybe a sort of 60, 70, 80% of the business by December of this year, but we actually won't get back to 100% of our business until December 2021. So it's a lot taking a lot longer than was initially anticipated. Yes. Similarly, in our UK business, we're seeing um, similar things. We think that'll come back a little bit quicker. We think um, Boris Johnson has Brexit ahead of him as well as dealing with, with COVID. So we think they'll try and turn the economy back on, on that bit quicker, which will shorten that time period. And in the US, it's very interesting. We're operating from the Midwest, Northeast, down in South Carolina and also in Florida. And what we're finding is, is that the sort of the store side of our business is performing well and has been less so impacted. Our food to go is, is being is performing well, especially with our, with our drive through. So I think the lockdown for an American is extremely different to a lockdown for an Irish and English person. And maybe Derek will, will, will address to that. So I think we're talking at least a year away and up to two years before we're, we're, we're fully back 100%. Well, Derek, would you like to pick that up um, uh, yes. from, uh, you know, from the US perspective in terms of where lock how lockdown has impacted you in your particular business? You've got 419 stores across 
nine US states, but those location of those states is quite important in terms of how the lockdown has been imp has impacted you, I, sus I suspect, in the US, as Joe was saying. Um, and perhaps you'd like to expand on, on that from your experience. Certainly. And, and Dan, I think you touched on it, is the, the vastness of the estates and having, you know, 50 different sets of lockdowns or status has created a weird op opportunity from a business standpoint. So much to Joe's point, we're seeing tangible differences, whether it's in our Midwest markets or down through the Southwest, New, New Mexico, Texas, some of those regions. I think with each of, of the governors going to a different sort of lockdown, or certainly right now, we're right on the cusp where things are slowly starting to loosen up. And, you know, as in essential business, all of our stores have maintained safe and open hours throughout the pandemic, but in various states. So in a region, for instance, like Texas, we are seeing a lot more movement, um, you know, Weather-wise, uh, we had 90 degree plus temperatures last week into this week. And you're starting to see a little bit of the return to traffic. Uh, certainly gallons are starting to trend up and in inside traffic for the stores. I would say going up northward, uh, as you get into Oklahoma and Kansas and some of the Midwest and the plain states, um, you know, things are still slow. So it is going to take a little longer um, I, I would like to think not as long as uh, Joe spelled out, but Joe, I, I, I think that's good guidance, though. I mean, that is a great way for us to look through a conservative lens. And unlike all the prognosticators who say it's going to be a V that comes right back, mm -hmm. I'm more in your camp, too. I, I, I think it is going to take a little bit longer than people realize. And the comeback might only be, call it 75 to 90 percent of what it was prior but the behaviors have changed significantly and in some ways that will never come back. And so as a merchant and as a retailer, we must evolve forward to meet those new needs that are gonna be in the post COVID world. Debbie, um, would you like to, to respond from, from your position in your business and, and in the UK particularly, obviously? Um, well, firstly, thank you everyone for joining and I hope that you're all um, uh, well. Um, what a great opportunity just to share a, a panel with such uh, esteemed folks. It's, it's a really great opportunity. Thank you. Um, I just want to start off by saying we're not using the word back ever. It's banned <laughs> within our cooperative society because we only have the future. And we're very much looking at what is happening and we're looking at it through uh, several lenses. Obviously, the global economic factors, the implications from a retail perspective, but also from a social um, perspective. So I'm just echoing what I've, I've, I've heard uh, from, uh, from Joe and, and, and Derek is um, all of those things have changed dramatically. And we have not actually known anything like it. So people are making comparisons with the market um, crash in 2008. But actually that was brought around for a whole different set of uh, circumstances. And we can model recoveries. We know that convenience did well in the last recession. We know that convenience retailing is doing well um, at the moment. I would caveat that by saying pre-lockdown, um, the panic buying meant that our sales doubled, along probably with most other people's. Um, they then sort of established themselves around a plus 28, plus 30 position. It did coincide with the warmest April on record. So the weather impact um, that was mentioned earlier has an impact um, in the UK. When the rain came, the sales were suppressed a little bit. But on to the fuel um, point, uh, fuel, there was some panic buying before lockdown, so we saw a spike. Uh, demand dropped considerably and we were in the minus 70s. Um, usage has definitely started to come back and we're probably at minus 60. Um, in our own planning, we've done a couple of things to help us uh, consider what any um, what the future could look like. So we've looked at the occupancy of all of our businesses to ensure that we can operate in a safe way, almost indefinitely, but certainly for the next year, 18 months, because we think people will want to come back to work when they know they are safe. 
uh, of course, most of our colleagues on the front line have, have continued to work throughout this, and I have to call them out as individuals. I think the whole of society is in awe of what they have been doing, um, and I think that their status uh, will soar as a consequence of, of, of this. But brave people going each day, turning up to uh, work, not knowing what they're actually going to um, going to face. The other thing we've done is preferences. So we've asked people, we've seen some of our team thrive in this situation. People that maybe um, we hadn't seen that level of, of talent and, and bandwidth. And we've seen others who have found it very, very difficult indeed. So we know that as from a central perspective, uh, a support centre, that maybe only 40% of us will be able to return but it won't be this 40% constant. So we think that people will not be going to their usual place of work in our business for one or two days a week for the next 12, 18 months. So sort of similar timelines. Mm -hmm. So that's helping us project what we think will happen to our fuel usage, but also what might happen on the food side of the business as well. That's very interesting. Let me just throw in a bit of research that I was reading about this morning uh, from The Economist, which look, compared Sweden um, with Denmark in terms of spending patterns amongst uh, consumers and the impact, if you like, the economic impact of, of lockdown. Interestingly, what it showed is that it's pretty similar. So despite very different government policies, um, which we've all read about in Sweden versus Denmark, the impact actually on spending patterns was, was not obviously very different, um, which made the economists presume that actually a lot of this is about consumer uh, confidence, if you like, and anxiety, and uh, their own choice, if you like, consumer choice in terms of where they feel, you know, what, what they feel comfortable doing, as opposed to government policy. So I suppose if that's the case, um, and it seems a pretty solid piece of research, you know, I guess one of the big challenges for retailers uh, is, is, and you mentioned it, Debbie, thinking about your your team, um, in very well very well said. But I, it's restoring confidence in the consumer and your customers as well to <coughs> use your stores, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, sort of redesign and relay out of stores is going to become a huge a huge issue. I think we need to look after ourselves, our staff, very well in terms of everything from sanitizers to face masks and to the, the markers of the, of, the, of the two meter distances. I think we need to make sure we get sort of the, the, the queuing systems outside the shops for people coming in and coming out. And I think that's going to persist longer than we actually think because I think it's the confidence of a customer to come into the shop is what it's really all about. And I think the opportunity for people in our sector is that I think there'll be quite a, a negative impact against the small little shops that will find it difficult to, to operate and to give that customer confidence in the distance. And I think that's an opportunity for ourselves and especially in areas where if you've got drive-throughs, click and collect, I think those, that part of the business is definitely seeing a boost and we would see a sort of a paradigm shift towards that. We would also agree with, with Debbie's point, we think there's going to be a change in how staff go to work in future. I think there'll definitely be more remote working from home coming in maybe a couple of days, staying home a couple of days a week, going in for sort of two or three days a week, that type of idea. So that will impact shopping local versus sort of shopping close to to a, their, their staff locations. So I think there will be lots of impacts. But one thing is interesting when we talk, Debbie there reminded me of, of saying about looking after staff. One of the cultural differences between, say, our business in Ireland, the UK, and what we see in the States is that in the States, when COVID came, the first reaction from quite a lot of retailers was to increase the wage rate of staff by $2.50 an hour to encourage them to come into work and stay in work because the government incentives were so strong to keep them out of work. It was, uh, it was interesting, and I haven't seen that before, and it's interesting having the benefit of, of the span of the different markets that we, we, we work in to see that. And the one thing I would call out, and I would say it, it's really important for all of us to sort of big hands up of appreciation to all our governments from the, the support they've given us from the furlough scheme in the UK to the wage subsidy and the temporary layoff schemes in, in Ireland and the, and, the, and the wage supports in the US has been really beneficial to right size the business in terms of getting the costs 
we've had a huge fall off in our customer base for our food to go versus the grocery and store side of the business. So I think that's, that, that's really important to say and, and to recognize that. I was going to come in. I think that's a good chance to bring Derek in on that point, really. And it was a question that was a few people started sending in questions ahead of the the, um, the uh, shop talk uh, shop talk programs, which I think is great. By the way, <coughs> if you fancy doing that, and I'll bring that question in on that point because it was really around. I mean, Apple Green are very famous, if you like, for establishing being the pioneers of multiple branded offers within the store and and food venience, as we as we call it. And Derek, I mean, all sups are very famous for their in your New Mexico, uh, I know this because I did a bit of research, but in your New Mexico sites for your burrito offer, you know, your, your um, deep fried burrito, is that? Deep fried, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds good. So, Happy choice, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of neutral uh, version. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, certainly I, I, I think that we all have started to hit on some of the themes and Debbie made a point that she's banned the word back, which I think resonates exceptionally well. And what we've seen has also echoed some of the things that Joe shared. Um, I, I think that unlike past issues that we've had, this one is probably more like 9-11 or even going further back in that what happened prior, things that were acceptable will no longer be considered such. And I know that's a pretty bold, broad statement to make, but some of the first areas of the business that started to be impacted were things such as self-serve food. And as a strategy, many of us in small format retail, you could go made to order or crew serve, or you could go self-serve, either fresh to go, hot to go, ambient temperatures and everything from fresh bakery products to roller grill food items, to even dispense beverages and having an open condiment well. I think the the, the consumer's expectations post-COVID will look at those things as relics of the past. So I think it's a combination, Dan, in terms of embracing technology and the role that that can play, and whether it's automated systems and vending and food diners and things that can mm -hmm. prepare food in a safe and sanitary manner. Uh, you know, we've seen everything globally from coffee to even hot prepared foods that can come out of a unit. Stay on technology, Derek, because obviously you, Derek, I, as you guys know, probably spent a lot of years at Rutter's and technology and food service was, was, was pretty big. So you've got quite a good loyalty program at Yesway, haven't you? Um, yep. Is that something which is suddenly going to become critical as you try and um, bring the customers back? Absolutely. I, I, I use yeah. that word, Debbie. I apologize. Yeah, not back <laughs> as, <laughs> as we try to push them forward or, or, <clears throat> or push through this. And I, I, I think, Dan, that the technology and that was a critical uh, point. I think I've heard you say it, and I also feel this way. We're in the age of acceleration, where a lot of technologies that were innovative are now expectations for the consumer, whether that's curbside or delivery or click and collect or BOPUS, all of these things that have been buzzwords. Um, you know, the whole notion of frictionless checkout has dominated for the past five years. It's now about touchless or contactless. And how can you deliver an experience either through a team member in gloves and packaging that is contactless? And if it's technology-based, if it's using your app, your loyalty program to empower customers to redefine what convenience now means is bring it to me and I want it now and I want it touch free, then we have to use the loyalty platform and the apps to do that. If they're still coming to the stores, which they will, then how can I change the layout, design, my offering to have crew serve, less self-serve or even no self-service in those categories because the expectations of sanitation have increased substantially. Yeah, it's a new, it's a new level, isn't it? Um, on the acceleration of technology point, Joe and, and Debbie, um, whoever wants to go first on that, has technology implementation accelerated in your businesses? Debbie, would you like to go or will I go? Go on, Joe, you go. Yeah, I, I would say we, we would see, it's interesting, the uh, click and collect um, order, order and delivery has all really increased. Um, there's a massive fall off in cash, an absolutely massive fall away from cash, a massive fall away from ATM machines. So I think there's definitely going to be some design changes. 
Um, so I think uh, that type of technology w will be very helpful. I think people will be doing a lot more of sort of order and collect, like they call curbside, curbside in America. I think that will definitely be there. Um, the sort of the the more local usage, I think, is, is, is going to be key. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to use our loyalty programs to attract people sort of locally and to buy, to buy and, uh, and collect from, from local and getting much more home deliveries and delivering in what we call that last mile, being part of the community. I think they're going to be um, very important. And I think the other thing that we're doing now is we're, we're wrapping our arms around the partnership programs with, with our food brands like sort of Starbucks, KFC, Burger King, Subway, and utilizing their programs to, uh, to, to benefit and, and piggyback on their expertise in that area. But there's definitely going to be design changes in our business. We won't, be go we won't sort of return to where it was before. I think we need to adapt our offer and bring and bring it forward and i think it'll it'll offer a huge amount of increased opportunity to us i think we've all seen huge increases in in sort of um home meal replacement alcohol pharmacy products grocery items and i think that size of the business and co-op would see would see it even more than our business i think that's an opportunity and if you if the last point i'd make is go back to where we were two three four years ago everything was get rid of grocery put in food to go Mm -hmm. And that food to go now is by far the most impacted part of our business, and really, it's the um, it's it's the grocery that that is ho is holding everything together. So, I think it it's interesting. We would see it as we need to increase the planning permission that we get for larger sites, so that, that you can do both. You can have both grocery and and some um, food to go, and um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how how the whole design changes impacts the future. Over to you, Deb. Debbie, on acceleration. Thank you very much. <laughs> so definitely the biggest acceleration has been payment methods mm -hmm. um, where cash has almost disappeared. Um, so that is that just went overnight and was particularly assisted by um, lifting the, cap, the contactless payment to £45. Mm -hmm. pounds. So that helped um, and that's been actively encouraged, I think pretty much by every retailer um, in the UK and almost... Um, our um, teams in shops are, are actually now, if someone's offering them money, they're almost going, oh, must you? So, you know, we, we've again seen a massive behavioral change. We also have a loyalty scheme. It's, it's actually a membership scheme. So you join and you become an active member. You have the choice of taking personal benefits as a result, or you have the option of giving those to communities. So we match anything um, that is put into community funds. And the way that we have helped, probably the most vulnerable, bearing in mind that some of the most vulnerable also don't have any other method of paying other than cash, um, is actually by them um, being able to phone um, and their um, our membership scheme number where we can actually just provide them with, with assistance. So some really simple techniques, but we've also worked a lot with voluntary groups that have actually been assisting in the last mile and also with local authorities getting food parcels to vulnerable people. And, and I suspect that the, those behaviours will continue because we have to remember that many of the people that are vulnerable, as, um, we're, we're classifying them as vulnerable. It, it's got nothing to do with COVID-19. Um, there, there are always vulnerable people in our communities. Um, and I think we'll find better ways of, of meeting their needs. And online is proving very beneficial um, of, of actually reaching and communicating uh, with those customers and members um, too. So um, with both, uh, both of you, I, I think um, there is a huge opportunity. And probably also um, there is a real role for us. We need to step up and meet mm. the changing um, needs of the communities we serve. I know from talking to you, Joe, and, and also you, Derek, you know, that as just like Debbie said, I mean, you, you're, you're, you've really stepped up to play that role in your community during this time. And, mm -hmm. you know, frankly, I, I, that won't be forgotten, I don't think. You know, it will be remembered for a long time and, uh, you know, um, a credit to, to, to what, you, what you, I know you've all done there. Um, mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got tons of questions coming in, so I'm just going to 
can I, I just could, Dan, can I just one, add one other technology area just be, to, before you jump to questions? Yeah. It's the whole area of what I would call back office and the improvement in back office systems, especially HR and sort of payment to staff and putting rosters available on phones and that side of technology. And I'd like to sort of put a, a, a big sort of um, thank you to, I know all our HR team in the three markets that we operate in have done atrocious work. Helping us, helping us through this this crisis, and I'd imagine Derek, Derek and Debbie are the same. But I think that technology in back office systems automation, ordering and managing people, and cleaning rosters, and you name it, I think that's a whole other area of technology development that is really going to come into its own um, when we return back to full time work. So that's absolutely what they support that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So healthy food to go products, I've had a question in to say, is there any data around healthy food to go product ranges? We've seen a reduction, and this is a supplier speaking, we've seen a reduction of 65% in sales as a result of consumer behavior. So, you know, a change in, 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 in buying patterns around healthy food to go. Um, is that something which you, you, would, you would agree with? Um, does, that, does that make sense? And any, any, any comments on that? Well, I'll dive in first. Um, I I just think that some of what you're seeing and why those have gone down from a uh, sell-through standpoint is we went from what was pantry loading to panic buying. And so I think in that panic buying, there was a return to comfort. And whether it's, you know, the the security of having 100 rolls of, of toilet paper pantry loaded or having soup and other comfort foods and a product, all of that came at the expense of some of the emerging trends that all of us as retailers were driving. And that's better for you, healthier, those types of uh, products. Now, I, I think coming out of this, that there will be some level setting and that those opportunities may come back. But in the near term, you know, we've all seen the memes at Pope Fun at, you know, you would see a grocery store and everything completely wiped out except for the vegan food. And it said, even in a pandemic, no one's buying this. I, I think that there's some kernels of a truth there, but long-term consumers are much savvier, knowledgeable about what they're putting into their bodies. And as we continue to go through this and you see issues at meat processing plants and things of that nature, they're going to want local, organic, fresh, all of those big emerging trends that have fueled the past couple of uh, decades. And as retailers, we have to figure out a way to get it to them in a contactless manner. Debbie, you wanted to come in on that one too. Yeah, I just say the stats, it's minus 65% are about right for food to go in our business, not just healthy food to go. So I really wanted to make that distinction. Um, But there are definitely signs that it's coming back So I think what did happen, exactly as Derek uh, described, people went to comfort food, they had time on their hands, they rediscovered baking um, and cooking and all the rest of it. I suspect after five, six, seven weeks, the novelty wears off. So we're definitely seeing um, a return to sandwiches, to snacking, healthy snacking, um, etc. But what's happened is... I think we're as guilty as retailers, but suppliers also have a role to play. We cut the ranges down too quickly um, because of wastage and we haven't built them back up. Mm. So they're just, to me, there doesn't seem to be enough choice out there. So people that have settled into the routine of home working like we're all doing uh, today, perhaps we were making things at home. We're now desperate for our daily exercise. We're probably using that to go to a shop to buy something. And and certainly I would say to any suppliers, have a look again, encourage retailers to expand the offer a little bit, you know, just be cautious, but introduce a few new things. If you're living locally, you're shopping locally, you don't want a choice of three or four sandwiches to choose from because you're bored, you're going to be bored. So seasonality and real variety and um, different fillers, different carriers, really think about that i think it's a big opportunity because people are out there more than they usually are and a question joe Joe, which you could which slightly moves that 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 point on that debbie's just just made is do you think food to go has declined due to safety concerns or just that people are not on the go you know where's the balance of truth there do you think 
Yeah, I would say it's predominantly the latter, not uh, people just aren't around. Mm. I think if you look at, say, Highways England have st statistics that come out every day about the number of vehicles on the road, and you can more or less match and correlate the decline in food to go sales with the decline in transactions because there's less people on the roads and they, and they mirror each other. And there's just less people around. So they're going, doing their larger shops. There's an increase in people doing their one large shop uh, while they have time to do it. And they want to be um, less, less uh, put themselves in an environment less often where they could potentially pick up the virus. So they're doing a lot more baking and cooking at, at home. So I think food to go will come back strong once more customers are back on the road and they're delighted. Um, we think that the sort of the day the um, the roads are opened up, people will be off out looking to contact their grannies and grandparents and family and friends and they'll be back traveling and um, we definitely think there's going to be a lot more staycations i think um i think it'll take a long time before people have the confidence to jump into a plane and and fly to different parts of europe or with or, or within the states so i think we'll benefit from that and um, be ready for that so there's different parts of the business will be impacted differently dan mm. yeah and um I suppose just another question on another point that uh, that I know, Joe, you've been doing delivery for, you know, really going out of the way for certain customers. Debbie, you were talking about your vulnerable uh, customers who were vulnerable anyway, um, regardless of, 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 of safe self-isolation. So a lot of convenience retailers have started doing delivery. Is this something which will be sustained as a business opportunity and a customer need locally around your stores after uh, the, the, the we, we, we come out of, of this uh, is it is it something that you will continue to do um, how do you manage that and that question is coming from Mexico retailer in Mexico we definitely if, if I'll, I'll do a, a quick answer before Debbie or Derek gets in we would definitely see this as being a trend we see ourselves as being part of the community within what they call the last mile and we definitely think there's an opportunity there and it's a matter how do you how do you react to that and make it profitable in terms of providing that service? That's going to be the change and shift in how we do our business into the future. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I would chime in and I would share many of the same thoughts. Uh, think that you know, post COVID, this is going to continue to grow and be a need state that customers demand from us and whether we go third party or we do it on our own terms. But I do want to offer a bit of a contrasting point there because, you know, we are still local. We own the corners. Uh, part of the last mile that Joe just talked about, I think having curbside or express contactless, frictionless, whatever you want to call it, BOPIS, buy online, come in the store quickly and pick up in, in store. I think those are also alternatives that will help us win as a channel. I think long term where Joe started to share I see bigger negative impact on things such as travel by cruise or air, airplanes and things of that ilk. I actually think that we're shaping up to have a huge summer and I'm optimistic that people with all of the cabin fever and social distancing and being mm -hmm. pent up, mm -hmm. the road trip by car with the family and making those pit stops along the way into our stores is, mm -hmm. is going to be probably larger than it's been in the past decade. And if it's a staycation or a local and traveling four, six hours, 10 hours away by vehicle, I think well, that's something that we need to be It's going to feel like freedom, isn't it? Yes. It's going to feel like freedom. Well, I mean, I, I, that's such a good point. Debbie, you were also going to come in on that, I think. Um, yeah, I, I just echo. I mean, if you think at any point in time, how many people are on holiday overseas? So in the UK, that's a massive proportion. We also have a travel business, so we know just how many would have been um overseas how many restaurants are closed how many pubs are closed how many workplace canteens all the school children all the universities and the uh, out of home settings where people would normally go for their food mm. it, it's all coming our way um mm. and i think there's just a real opportunity for us to surprise and delight and for them to really reappraise and um, what the purpose of the convenience, the community store means. Um, so I, I, I do think that we need to be uh, really uh, focused on getting the basics right, but giving them something really exciting and probably churning and bringing more change and variety through 
which might sound counterintuitive against everybody wanting to rationalize everything. Um, you know, people will get bored and they'll do things themselves. But if we really step up again, you know, yeah. I think there is a real opportunity and we'll become a more important, we'll have a more important role in people's lives than we did before. Really good point. And I think just to bring in another question, which just really, I think perfectly sort of uh, segues from, 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 from what you've just said, Debbie, is from Dev Dillon. And Dev was one of the authors of um, uh, the report that we covered in, in our first Shop Talk Live. Um, Dev says, do the panelists have a view on how urban convenience formats can recover in the new normal? And what he means of, is very small urban stores, which have got a less, which are getting far less footfall due to more home, well, obviously right now, but also perhaps over the next year, two years, perhaps due to obviously more home working. Um, you know, those, those, those stores were perhaps struggling a bit with high rents and rates um, before. Um, you know, are they really going to be struggling in the future? Because those stores aren't in the community like, uh, you know, like many of the locations that you guys were all talking about. I mean, are they really under tremendous pressure going forward? Yeah. I would say I would say absolutely they are um, the, the the sort of the, the rents and the rates are a huge huge issue and effectively stores have significant overheads and they need high volumes to kind of bring in the bottom line and suddenly if you're if you still have the same level of fixed costs and your sales are down sort of 50 60 percent you just haven't a, a hope of making a profit so I think it's going to be very difficult for a lot of those I think there's going to have to be a reshaping of what is the right level of commercial rent and rates that they're uh, that those locations attract I think it's going to be a partnership between landlords and retailers and if that doesn't happen I think there'll be a lot of casualties and in a, in a sort of separate vein I'm chairman of Retail Excellence Ireland and we do a lot of work on that and trying to lobby with the government to try and get support for the smaller retailers because it is a big issue in addition to a shortfall of of sales volume people are seeing an increase in operating costs for for all the covid um costs like hand sanitizers extra extra clothing um having staff outside to marshal marshal customers so it's a difficult, difficult time for for people in urban retail with high rents and small and small locations. Well, let's just take another question um, uh, because we got we've had so many questions um, on this, and uh, I'd like to try and take as many as as, as possible. So this one is uh, from Irish retailer, um, not one of your colleagues, Joe. Um, but um, do you think the green agenda has gone down in the list of customers of priorities in customers' minds due to the crisis? Um, and will it bounce back? So you can take that any way. I mean, you can take it looking at obviously electric vehicles, or you can take it as a, the broader environmental um, environmental mm -hmm. agenda. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to go to everybody because I think this is a very important question. So Debbie, uh, I know this is the the broader environmental agenda has always been something that's been very um, you've been very passionate about. Um, what do you think on that? Do you think this one will come back? And if so, how quickly? So um, uh, firstly, we're already hearing loads of new terms uh, as a consequence of this. And, you know, one of them is, you know, that the, the earth is healing. Um, we're hearing a lot, of, uh, a lot of that. And I expect that people are holding back at the moment, but an awful lot of analysis is taking place in the background to show how, um, how we have adapted relatively successfully, uh, but what the consequences of that, uh, that will be. So um, I think this is really, really tough because the, obviously the damage to the economy is, is colossal. And I think the estimates that we hear about Germany, the UK, and you know, the single digit, I'm kind of thinking, we'll be lucky if, if we get through this on, on, um, in single digit um, decline. We really will. Not us necessarily as a business, but just generally as an economy and as, as a whole. But what I'm also observing is perhaps some trends that have started some time ago. So lots of local groups have, have formed. So, you know, our road's got its own WhatsApp. It didn't have before. Both my grown up children, their streets both did. And it's all about conserving. It's all about being um, responsible. They're at home, they're seeing how much waste they're actually generating. Um, and I think people are asking themselves lots of questions. And I also feel that there's a lot of self-responsibility coming through in this. 
So proportions that are always looking for people to make decisions for them, but a lot of people taking control in communities and doing some incredible work. So, you know, we cannot let that agenda uh, slip. However, we absolutely, safety has to come first. Um, and that will be the big dichotomy. Yes, Joe, and then I'll come to you, Derek, on the same question, the, the, the green agenda. Yeah, I, so in terms of the green agenda, just taking it in, in two ways. Uh, first, the Irish government hasn't formed yet, so you've a, it looks like you're going to have a three-party coalition, probably with the third party coming in as being the Greens. So I think they will significantly influence what, what happens over the next uh, five to ten years in Ireland. Um, I think there'll be a massive reduction in any uh, sort of carbon generating products and industries. I think there'll be very much a push towards minimizing travel, whether it's air travel or, 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 or car travel and trying to promote promote the green agenda. So I definitely think that's there. And I would echo Debbie's points. And I, I think they're pushing on an open door in terms of customers want to do that and they see the benefits. So I think that is definitely here to stay and will enhance. On the second element of it in terms of electric vehicles, I think there's there's two ways of looking at it. I think on one, on one side, there's definitely a push towards people want to have more electric vehicles, but because of the price of the barrel of oil has dropped so much, right. yep. um, the re giving the reason to customers to change the, the much more exp expensive electric car in the first place is going to take more time. So I think it might push the adoption of electric vehicles out maybe a year or two years. I think it'll definitely still be there. I think there definitely will be electric vehicles into the future, but I think the adoption rate might be pushed out by a year or two. Derek, Derek, we can chat about this. Um, would you like to take the EV point as well to see if um, what your view is uh, on, on that? Does it chime with Joe's? Certainly will. I mean, I, I think that the fuel pricing is not to be taken lightly. I mean, we all have seen what has happened with crude. Um, we operate stores in, in the Permian Basin. We're in South Dakota and Wyoming where there's shale and fracking and mining going in those markets too. And you know, short-term impact has been a lot of those wells and those uh, drills have shut down. Now, I, I think that they can be reopened at a future date, but the price sensitivity, and we know that fuel is one of the most irrationally perceived price commodities that are out there. So I, I think that, you know, these, this acceleration age is definitely going to accelerate some of the green aspects. I still feel that EVs are pretty far off in terms of mainstreaming in your urban markets where the density is there and there's you know, fewer vehicle miles travel. I think there will absolutely be an acceleration and you can see that in, you know, down to the stock of uh, Tesla, which is you know, skyrocketing right now as we all talk, whereas mainstream manufacturers, their stock prices are going down. So that is the market making a bet of saying, here's where we believe that the trends are going to come. But there's a lot of segmentation. You know, when you look at the various future of fuels and whether they be diesel and carbon based or gasoline to hydrogen and some of the emerging technologies, I think Debbie put it best, this healing of the planet has been a pause moment. And I think it is something that each of us and all the consumers will keep with them for the rest of our lives. And so that is definitely going to accelerate and have an impact. One, one additional point is worth, worth saying on it, Derek, is, is there looks like there's a trend now for people in China to look more to use their own cars rather than using um, uh, sort of shared transport vehicles and buses and trains themselves. Yes. So I think this could be a bounce back towards our industry, given that customers will be afraid to get on um, on tubes, trains and planes and buses. So um, it could be with every cloud, it could be a silver lining. I've heard that as well. And I think that's what the Chinese experience was after SARS, Joe. You know, they saw yeah. you know massively increased car sales after the SARS experience. So mm. it'll be, I guess, even greater um, mm. uh, now. And, uh, you know, very good point. Um, a well-known consultant, uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, came up with, a, and they probably charge a lot more money than I do because I couldn't come up with this, but they said, um, if, a, if a town gets knocked down by a hurricane, you don't build it the same, you build it better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that maybe sums up some of the things that you guys were all saying around uh, the green agenda, and I hope it answers your question uh, uh, that, that was asked by the audience member there. You know, we've never had more questions, but 
Um, I think one of the things we try and keep to is, is, is time um, for, for, for this session. Um, so um, we're 45 minutes in and um, it just really, I'd just like to, to thank you, Joe, uh, Debbie and Derek uh, for fascinating. I mean, we could have spent a, a, a lot longer, but um, we, you know, we, um, we, 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 we'll, stick, we'll stick to the schedule. And uh, really, enjoyed it, Dan. really enjoyed it. We'd love to have yes, you. Yes, thank you very much. Well it's done, as always. It's great to get together, isn't it? And uh, we can't all go and have a drink afterwards, uh, although we definitely like to. Um, but um, but this is this is this gets us a little bit close to that, doesn't it? So uh, terrific to to catch up with you guys. And um, yeah, thank you, and thank you to the audience for watching, and particularly asking so many questions. Um, and as I said. Um, if you'd like to send in questions ahead of time, that's even easier for me to manage because I've got different bubbles opening up on my screen um, and I'm trying to sort of get through all the questions, but it's difficult with mm -hmm. so many. Um, but, Be uh, safe, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank Be you. Safe. Be safe. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of, of Shop Talk Live. Um, uh, and thank you again to, to, to our, our panelists, um, Joe Barrett, Debbie Robinson, and Derek Gaskins. Uh, just to, just for my sign off, um, we won't be um, we won't be uh, doing a shop talk live uh, next week. It's uh, Friday is a, is a is a public holiday in the UK, so we've got a break next week. Um, but do look out for um, our interview, exclusive interview with Ishvan Kapitani, um, uh, who's the uh, who's the global uh, executive VP for retail at Shell, which will be publishing on. Global Sea Store Focus early next week, so you can read that, and it's an interesting read uh, in terms of looking at obviously gl uh, Shell's global perspective on 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 this crisis and how they're managing it and um, and and doing it as you'd expect in a very positive way. So with that, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>